Well, thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to see such a large audience. I hope that you know it remains the same size for the other lectures that I give. There's two tests here today. <coughs> Please feel free to interrupt at any time and ask questions. And I've labeled this as part one because I'm going to deal with uh, microstructure today. But of course, uh, engineers are not interested in microstructure, they're interested in properties. So the next lecture will deal with properties. I'll only dwell on properties uh, very briefly in today's lecture. And the thing that I want to talk about is, of course, creep resistant steels. And just to give you an idea of how important uh, these materials are, this is one of my PhD students, here. it's a Tracy Cool. And the reason why she's dressed in that outfit is not to keep herself clean, but so that nothing of hers drops into this turbine, which is extremely well balanced. You know, so for example, a ring drops into it, then it causes difficulties. And this object, of course, extends quite a long distance in this direction, and it'll rotate at about 3,000 revolutions per minute, with steam temperatures up to 600 degrees centigrade, over a period reliably for 25 years. Now imagine the amount of reliability you expect from this compared with your computer, okay, which will crash every so often, you'll get bugs, and it's hardly a reliable technology. So if only we could put a bit of mechanical engineering into these things, you know, the discipline that we have in mechanical engineering, we would have a much better life. So what I'm uh, suggesting is that we are going to dare to design a material for something like this, which is of Vital uh, safety importance, you know, if this breaks, the momentum in all is just unbelievable. <coughs> and see whether it actually works. And the number of variables involved in designing a uh, 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 steel for an application like this is huge. And here is just a conservative list of variables. First of all, we can throw in many different elements into the steel. And some of them will be in large concentrations, for example, manganese and chromium to chromium there for oxidation and corrosion resistance. Some of them will be in parts per million, you know, sulfur, phosphorus, boron, etc. And yet, they will have a profound effect on the properties of the material. And you can continue this list. Modern uh, alloys uh, contain many other elements, uh, including exotic ones like rhenium and so forth and so on. You are all experts on welding, and you know how many different processes there are. And you know, I understand that you've added to this using your keyhole TIG process. So this list is an ever-growing list, the number of welding processes and the parameters that you could use. And with these materials, after you've created a beautiful microstructure, you more or less destroy it by giving a huge tempering heat treatment, which will stabilize the microstructure. So there's a very large number of variables involved in the design of any of these materials. But the essential microstructure is relatively simple. You will either have uh, plates of martensite or bainite when you form, uh, when you osmotize and then you cool to ambient temperature. And then you heat treat to precipitate a myriad of these tiny carbide particles which interfere with dislocation motion and therefore give you creep resistance. And this isn't just one type of carbide, there might be many, many different kinds of carbide that you induce in your sample to provide the creep resistance. So this operates in a regime where creep is essentially controlled by the movement of dislocations or obstacles by climb. Uh, we are not really concerned with, say, diffusion along grain boundaries or through the lattice itself. Uh, it's in a regime where dislocations control the creep rate. So this is the essential microstructure that we have to model, and it's the stability of this microstructure which gives us long-term properties. And a very simple classification of what is needed is that the material has to be able to uh, support the stress of 100 megapascals over a period of 25 years at approximately 600 degrees centigrade. That's a, a design requirement. And we have to use many different kinds of models to create such a uh, material. Uh, now, of course, there are many steels already in existence, but the demand is to go to ever higher temperatures because, uh, you know, the Carnot cycle says that we get higher and higher efficiency as we increase the steam temperature. So we want to go to as high a steam temperature as possible. And at the moment, 
Yeah, there exist commercial plants with steam temperatures of the order of 610 degrees centigrade. We'd like to go even higher. Thermodynamics forms the basis of uh, almost every calculation that you can do on a microstructure because it provides us with a phase diagram which tells us that we have so much of this phase and the composition of each phase is this and that the free energy change when you go from the matrix to the precipitate is so much. And you can use all that information to work out the kinetics of transformation and therefore a microstructure. Uh, microstructure itself is not enough. We need to predict things like creep properties, fatigue, toughness, etc. And this is the basis of my talk tomorrow. The really complicated mechanical properties. How do we predict them? Uh, in addition, there are areas for which we have no models. Simply, the research hasn't been done. Nobody can predict oxidation resistance, for example, of these materials. All we do is measure them and use qualitative experience to design for oxidation resistance. Whatever material you design has to be able to be processed. That means forged into the right form, etc. So you have to allow for that. And of course, uh, cost is extremely important when you're making really large constructions. So for example, rhenium is an incredibly expensive element, and even though it improves the creep properties enormously, we are not really allowed to use it. And finally, you get to an alloy design, and then you do some sort of a validation of the work. So, beginning with thermodynamics, this is a ternary phase diagram. We're we plotting iron, carbon, and chromium here. And this is a calculated phase diagram. You can routinely do calculations like these, either by you know, downloading free software on the web or buying commercial software, which will allow you to do a lot more. And the essential features of this phase diagram is that if you look at any particular phase field, here for example, it tells you what are the stable phases. So we have graphite, ferrite, and a chromium carbide called CR7C3, chromium, a particular kind of chromium carbide. The compositions of those phases are given by the corners of this tight triangle. And if I plot a point over here, I can work out how much of ferrite there is, how much of graphite there is, and how much M7C3 there is under equilibrium conditions. So that's what a phase diagram gives us. And this is a ternary phase diagram, so this represents a constant temperature plot. And you can see how complicated it is. You know, there are many, many phases, and it's hard to visualize what's happening. But the essential information is that we have volume fractions, we have chemical compositions of the phases, and of course we have free energy data. So if I now extend this to many elements, okay, it's impossible to draw a diagram. Okay, if I go to four elements now, I'd have to have a three-dimensional structure to represent just a constant temperature. If I go to five elements, it just becomes impossible, and you make many mistakes in drawing such diagrams. But the essential information doesn't change. Even if you have 20 elements, what we are interested in is the volume fractions of the phases, the chemical compositions, and the free energies. Okay? So I'm not going to uh, go on to describe you know, multi-component phase diagrams, because there's nothing more complicated than those three parameters that we need to look at. We don't need to draw the phase diagram, and it's impossible to draw in any case. This, of course, is the equilibrium phase diagram. That's why I have <coughs> graphite here. Graphite really doesn't form under ordinary circumstances in these steels. Instead, we get cementite, which is Fe3C. Okay. So this gives you the equilibrium phases, and that's not what we have in our microstructure. But nevertheless, this information is important in doing calculations. And you can actually do the same sort of calculations for non-equilibrium phases. So here, what we've done is we've allowed only the carbon to diffuse, but the substitutional elements are not allowed to diffuse, and calculated a phase diagram for exactly the same system. So it's not equilibrium, but it's what we call <coughs> para-equilibrium, where substitutional atoms are not mobile, but carbon atoms are. Okay? So you can even do calculations for constrained equilibria. So this is one. The okay, case, so and if you just compare against the equilibrium phase diagram, you can see how big a change there is in the phase fields. So, 
these things are really important and affect the microstructure in a big way. So let's assume now that we have thermodynamics because you can buy more or less for any alloy system. You can buy the database and the computer program to calculate such phase diagrams because people have done work in this area for more than 50 years. And these databases are extremely well established. So we we'll take thermodynamics as a given. Now, to make that rotor in the power station, we not only need the steel, but we need to join it as well. Okay. And the case that I'm going to make is that although we are dealing with well metal and plates as separate entities in the manufacturing process, they really are not very different at all. You know, if I plot the chemical composition of the well metal and of the plate in the classic power station steel two and a quarter chrome one moly, you can see that more or less the concentrations are identical with a few exceptions here, for example, oxygen concentration is a lot higher in a well metal because it's a dirty process compared with steel making. So you introduce oxides into the well, but oxides don't really have much of an effect on creep, so we can ignore that. And similarly, if you go to a steel like P91, really there's not much of a difference in the chemical composition between a well metal and a plate. So we don't need to think of them as separate entities from the point of view of microstructure they will have essentially the same microstructures. And even if we have the as deposited microstructure of the weld compared with the plate which has undergone a lot of heat treatment, we are going to heat treat the weld after the welding operation. So we will wipe out its original microstructure and then tend to become very similar. Okay. So from, yeah? Yes. Um, just coming back to the base material and cleanliness and mm -hmm. well metal, and you are absolutely right. The main thing coming is um, trace elements or the uh, contamination, whatever, either from the consumable or from the environment. Mm -hmm. But with our keyhole trigger, our previous experience, we could get very low amount of these interstitial gases and others. Mm -hmm. But properties are horrible. They're not good. Right. So I think that's an area maybe we need to discuss a bit more with you. Okay. Um, normally, depending on the process, as you quite rightly mentioned, it can go from 150 or 100 ppm to 600, 700, uh, some of the rooted electrodes. But with QOT, um, if I remember, uh, David Bierman is not here, I uh, remember correctly, in some cases it's around 30, 40 ppm. Correct. But properties were not good. Yeah. So, Higher so, strength, relatively brittle. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, the microstructures may not be different, but the properties will be different. And that I will talk about in the next lecture. Okay, because you. you see, for example, boron, <coughs> let's just take boron. Yeah, even if you add in six parts per million, it will have a profound effect on the properties, okay? or hydrogen. And yet you will see no difference in the microstructure. So there, there are other mechanisms than microstructure which control properties, yeah. and you're absolutely right. So I will deal with that in the next lecture. But from the point of view of microstructure, these two have essentially the same structure. That means with tempered martensite or tempered bainite. Okay. So we, we won't distinguish between these two places uh, today. And here, here, for example, is work done by Baker and Nutting, going back to the 1950s where they took a martensitic and bainitic microstructure and did various heat treatments and characterized the phases. And because you are giving such severe heat treatments, there really isn't a difference between the sort of precipitates that you form starting from a martensitic microstructure as from a bainitic microstructure. So we have this simplification that whatever starting microstructure we have, we basically wipe it out because we give a severe tempering heat treatment and produce a dispersion of carbides which is more or less the same, irrespective of the starting microstructure. Okay, so let's just summarize. We've taken thermodynamics as a given, and we can calculate a phase diagram for a system containing 20 different alloying elements. That's absolutely no problem to do. But thermodynamics only gives you equilibrium or constrained equilibria. It doesn't give you the actual microstructure. 
Uh, after all, it just gives you volume fraction information, chemical composition information, and free energy. It doesn't tell you about particle size or even metastable phases which form before stable phases. Okay. So we need kinetic theory. And kinetic theory takes inputs from thermodynamics because nucleation, for example, depends on the driving force that you have, the undercooling below the equilibrium temperature. That we can calculate from thermodynamics, the driving force as a function of undercooling. Uh, growth, the compositions of the phases determine the growth rate because you would have to partition alloying elements between the phases. So for example, when ice forms from salty water, the ice is purer than the water from which it forms. So the salt has to diffuse ahead of the ice. Okay? So the composition, the equilibrium composition of the phases determine the growth rate. And then we need to combine nucleation and growth to get overall transformation kinetics. That means the volume fractions of phases as a function of time, temperature, and composition. And then we need to look at long-term stability because here we are designing for 25 years at 600 degrees centigrade. So coarsening uh, comes into it as well. So now I'm going to start with kinetic theory. And I won't go into nucleation because it's actually very simple. Uh, you basically need two parameters. You need the surface energy of each particle and the number density of nucleation sites and you can get an estimate of the nucleation rate. But the growth part is more difficult. So I'm going to start by talking about the growth of a precipitate in a binary system. For example, ice forming from salty water. Okay? Uh, and beta is the precipitate and alpha is the matrix. And you can see that the precipitate has a different equilibrium chemical composition from the matrix. This is the equilibrium composition of the matrix and the equilibrium composition of the precipitate. Okay. So these, this, these two points you get from the phase diagram, from the thermodynamics. Okay. So the reason why ice doesn't have much salt soluble in it is because the salt water, the water salt phase diagram says that ice is depleted in salt. Okay. So from the phase diagram we get that this is the composition of the precipitate and this is the composition of the matrix. And when all the precipita precipitation stops, you would have a flat profile here with this being the matrix and this being the precipitate. Okay. But while it's precipitating, of course, it will grow by taking solute from the matrix by diffusion along here. So I'm plotting concentration versus distance. Now, if I look at the same concentration profile a short time later, then the precipitate will have grown. Okay? That is the increment of growth, and therefore this profile will have moved. And the amount of solute that is absorbed into the precipitate in this process is given by this area here because you can see that we've incorporated this much solute into the precipitate. Okay? So I can express that mathematically by saying that this is the rate at which solute is absorbed. That means this concentration here minus this concentration times the increment of growth dx. So C beta minus C alpha into the growth rate of the precipitate is the rate at which it absorbs solute. Yeah. Everybody happy with that? Now that solute has to arrive at this point by diffusion. Okay? So if I show you the next slide, the solute that's entering the precipitate has to arrive by diffusion and we can use Fix's law to tell us the flux of solute. So it's simply the diffusion coefficient times the gradient of concentration. And of course, these two points are given by the phase diagram, so they remain fixed and therefore, the rate at which solute is absorbed by the precipitate must equal the rate at which it arrives by diffusion. Okay. Otherwise, we won't maintain the concentrations constant over here. So I can summarize the whole thing by saying that the rate at which the precipitate absorbs solute must equal the rate at which it arrives at that point by diffusion. Okay. You can then solve this equation in a straightforward manner and get the growth rate of that precipitate. So when you do that, you find that the precipitate increases in size with the square root of time. Okay? 
the reason why it increases with the square root of time is that as it grows, if I go back, as it grows, this distance here, the depleted region, increases in size. So solute has to arrive from further and further away to reach the precipitate. So if you think about ice forming on a pond, okay, as the layer of ice thickens, the heat has to diffuse through longer and longer distances to get to the atmosphere. So the thickening rate slows down. It's exactly like that. Okay. Right, so this is for a binary solution where we have just one solute and one uh, solvent. But of course our steels are not binary. They have many different elements. So for each element we have to write an equation like this. So here we have uh, the equation for carbon and this is the diffusion coefficient of carbon, the equation for chromium, diffusion coefficient for chromium, and so on, for all the different elements, and then solve them together. So you need a, a great deal of data on diffusion coefficients, for example, and the information from the phase diagram on the equilibrium concentrations. All that is possible, so we can do growth rate calculations. So we've done nucleation, we've done growth, we now need to work out the volume fraction as a function of time, temperature, and composition. So how do we do that? Because we've got particles nucleating all over the place. They're growing. They might touch each other. You know, we might get this physical contact, etc. And we need to deal with that. And that was solved. That problem was solved many, many years ago by Avrami, as follows. Okay. So imagine that this is our steel. And we've got two particles existing at the time alpha, uh, at the time t, sorry, by two particles of alpha. Short time later, of course, these particles will grow. Yeah. So this is the growth increment after a small time interval. But of course, we also have nucleation going on. So we might form two new particles here, uh, which contribute to the volume fraction. Now, I've deliberately drawn this diagram incorrectly. You can see that this particle here can't really form there because we already have a precipitate there. Okay. But how do I tell the mathematics that, look, there is a particle here and you shouldn't really be forming here? Okay. And that's the problem that Arami solved. Uh, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to assume that this is okay, that I can actually form a particle inside another particle. And if I add up the increment, of transformation, the dark blue colors, then I will get an incorrect answer. Okay. And that's what Arami called the extended volume. Okay. In other words, we are allowing particles to form wherever, even though they can't really form here, adding it up, and that's not going to be right. So that's the change in the extended volume of alpha, the incorrect change in fraction. And what we want is the real change in fraction. We don't want to count this particle here. Okay? So what do you do? Well, supposing that you say that the probability that your particle happens in the untransformed material is simply the fraction of untransformed material here. That means this term here. This is the fraction of untransformed parent phase. And if you multiply that with the wrong change in volume, then you get the right change in volume. So what we are saying is, first we calculate the incorrect change in volume, multiply it by the probability of finding new particles in untransformed material, then we get the correct fraction. Is everybody happy with that? Okay. Very, very... Uh, sorry, you... Okay? Yeah. 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 I'm being pushed here, Paul. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so let me, let me explain again, because it, it's uh, important. So the chance that this is a particle which has formed in untransformed material is simply the chance of finding untransformed material. Okay. So this is the volume of alpha, this is the total volume, and one minus that is simply the white region here. Okay. So that's the chance of finding untransformed material. If I multiply that by, uh, by the increment, yeah, which includes things which are formed incorrectly, then I correct for, for this particle here yeah, and get the right fraction. Okay, so 
essentially of Rome solved this problem more than 60 years ago. But from our point of view, this is still not good enough because it's just talking about one kind of particle forming. Whereas I explained to you that a typical steel will contain six or seven different kinds of precipitate. So we need to modify this. So here, for example, I don't have just alpha forming, but another kind of precipitate, beta. And this, this equation from Avrami doesn't contain any information about the second kind of precipitate. Okay. So what we need to do is to modify the equation to allow for the presence of beta. Okay. Because the amount of untransformed volume must take account of the beta phase as well as the alpha phase. And we need two equations, one for alpha, the increment in alpha, and one for beta. And then we solve these equations simultaneously. So if you like, this is a generalization of the Avrami theory, which helps you deal with many, many different kinds of precipitates at the same time. And it's very powerful, yet simple, simple modification. So let me show you some calculations for classical power plant steels. So this is the volume fraction being plotted versus time. Uh, and these are just calculations. This is cementite. Okay, so cementite forms extremely rapidly because it only requires the diffusion of carbon. But it's not the stable phase because alloying elements like molybdenum and chromium are much more powerful attractors of carbon than iron. Okay. So as soon as you start to get you know, molybdenum carbide forming, the cementite starts to dissolve. Okay, now in this calculation, I haven't told the cementite to start dissolving. This is happening automatically. As the molybdenum carbide grows, it grabs the carbon from the cementite, and because these equations are, are coupled, we are solving them simultaneously, you don't have to tell the system, look, at this point, this carbide starts to dissolve, and this one starts to grow. Everything happens naturally. Oops. Similarly, Eventually, when chromium carbide starts to form, because we have a larger chromium concentration, it steals the carbon from the molybdenum carbide, so this starts to dissolve. Okay. So all this is happening naturally. We don't have to tell the system that at this point you start and you stop, yeah, because that just introduces other parameters in the calculations. So I wanted to just focus on uh, an interesting result here, that this is a 2 and a quarter chrome 1 molybdenum steel, used in very large numbers of power stations. And we know that around 1,000 hours at 600 degrees centigrade, you start to get this chromium carbide forming, M23C6. If I slightly modify the chemical composition here yeah, to 3 weight percent chromium, this diagram changes completely. Okay. So 3 chromium, 1.5 molybdenum. And you can see now the M23C6 is forming in less than an hour. And of course, this experimental result has been known for many years, but it's only by coupling all these equations that you manage to make the right prediction that you drastically accelerate the precipitation of M23C6 by a slight alteration of composition. So things are very sensitive to the chemical composition. This is a, a, a relatively modern steel, uh, made by Nippon steel, NF616 is a very, very good steel. It can survive at temperatures in excess of 605 degrees centigrade for 25 years and 100 metapascal stress. And it also has the precipitation of intermetallic compounds, which happens after a, a long, <coughs> uh, long heat treatment. So it doesn't matter if we have nine or ten different kinds of precipitates, we can now model the formation of all these, and some of them are not stable, so you can say they dissolve completely, cementite, for example. Uh, all that can be allowed for. What's the normal in the composition of that? Right. So it's almost like P91, but it contains tungsten okay. as well, and that's that's responsible for this uh, lava space formation at a long time. Some people argue that lava space is not a good thing to have. Yeah. yeah? Nippon Steel claims that it actually improves the creep properties. And I suppose in this application, the toughness is not important, you know, because it's operating at a high temperature, so they may be right. 
Okay, so we've now got a complete theory for the microstructure. Uh, I just have one more slide to show you. Uh, is that in the power station industry, we are not very careful about specifying the steel composition. You know, I have seen specifications where they give the maximum carbon concentration, but nothing about the minimum. Yeah. So presumably, you know, if you've got a maximum of 0.15 weight percent carbon, you could tolerate zero weight percent carbon, which doesn't make sense because you will not have any precipitates for the creep resistance. And just to illustrate that. Here, I'm just altering the carbon concentration from 0.1 weight percent to 0.15 weight percent, and you can see quite drastic changes in the microstructure. Okay. So we, we need to be careful about the sort of specifications, which are very broad, but which will give quite drastic changes in microstructure, and later on you'll see, uh, tomorrow's lecture, you'll see changes in the properties. This is within specification, but, you know, the fraction of this phase has decreased drastically, the kinetics have changed, and so on. So it really doesn't make sense to have a maximum carbon concentration without a minimum there. But a lot of specifications do that. I'm now going to, uh, apart from these general predictions that, you know, if I change the composition slightly, I greatly accelerate M23C6 precipitation. Uh, we need to do some very careful validation of these models by really by counting precipitates, looking at their sizes and so on. And this is uh, now just to show you how accurately or inaccurately the calculations have uh, work. So th this is very careful done, uh, very careful work done by <coughs> one of my students using uh, electron microscopy, where he's looking at a particular kind of power station steel and. Here we are plotting volume fraction versus time. Uh, this is for cementite and this is for uh, molybdenum carbide. Okay, so you can just to give you an idea of the level of agreement that we have between experiment and theory. This looks reasonable. Uh, this doesn't look all that reasonable. You can see this is here we are plotting the length of molybdenum carbide precipitate. So these are in the shape of uh, needles. Um, so we are modeling the growth of needles. And you can see that we are sort of <coughs> underestimating the length of molybdenum carbide precipitates by a significant amount. And here we are plotting the number density. So that's where nucleation rate comes in <coughs> and growth rate comes in. And this is the calculated curve. And you can see, again, we are underestimating, uh, at least over this time period, we are underestimating the number density of particles. So the theory is not perfect, but on the whole, it's making reasonable predictions of trends. Again, this is uh, uh, a distribution of particle size. You can see this is the experimental distribution. We predict a much narrow distribution of particle sizes. OK, now tomorrow I'm going to talk about properties, but I just need to show you uh, something about properties, because you know the engineer is not interested in carbide particles and dispersions and so forth. Uh, and I'll, I'll reveal how we do property calculations. But here are some calculations of properties where we are plotting the uh, creep rupture stress versus, say, the nickel concentration or the aluminum concentration. And we get this line along with an uncertainty in the prediction. Okay. So let's assume that we can now do creep rupture calculations. So these are not experiments, they are calculations. Creep rupture stress being plotted as a function of many, many variables. Uh, we can also uh, work out where that creep strength comes from. Yeah? So for example, this is a 2 and a quarter chrome 1 moly steel. And much of the creep properties at 550 degrees centigrade come from the precipitate distribution. Of course, the iron itself has a certain amount of strength and solid solution strengthening contributes. As we go to 600 degrees centigrade, the size of the pie chart is related to the creep rupture strength. So the creep rupture strength drops <coughs> remarkably because this steel is not really designed for 600 degrees centigrade. You know, its operating temperature typically is 540 degrees centigrade. Uh, and the contribution from precipitates becomes much smaller. Uh, that's reasonable because you get coarsening very rapidly at 600 degrees centigrade. 
And then the solid solution stretching term dominates the microstructure. So if you want to design for much higher temperatures where the precipitates are not going to be stable, you have to exploit solid solution strengthening. So if you like, we have deconvoluted the strength of the steel into components, and that can be done also for the different kinds of precipitates that we have. So the red color refers to 600 degrees centigrade, and that color to, uh, I think, 550. Let me just check that. Yeah, 550 degrees centigrade. Blue color is the contribution at 550 and at 600 from the different kinds of precipitates and uh, elements in solid solution that we have. So you can relate structure to properties. Okay. And I'll explain how later. Now it turns out that we can actually make predictions of properties very accurately. So these were, in fact, data that were presented at a conference by uh, a scientist from Nippon Steel for a <coughs> welding alloy that they developed. I mean, this was actually in London. So we took him back to our department and sat him at a computer, and these are his calculations using our model. Okay. So look, this is going to 10,000 hours, so testing for more than one year. Okay. And although <coughs> uncertainties are very large, because these, this is a new alloy system, nevertheless, the actual results are predicted fairly accurately. Now, of course, we used all this theory to design a couple of steels. This is now uh, talking about five years ago. And we designed two steels because one of these uh, is rich in cobalt, okay, whereas the other one doesn't have cobalt. And there's an issue with cobalt that it becomes more difficult to recycle steels if you have cobalt in the steel. Uh, we also predicted from theory that we really don't want silicon in our steel because that encourages the formation of lava spaces and we don't want nickel because again that exploits the coarsening of the okay, So we, we tried to specify this as zero and this as zero but these are the concentrations that we turned up with eventually. We want uh, free nitrogen so we've kept the aluminum concentration as low as possible. And we published a paper called The Theoretical Design of Creep Resistant Steel. So we didn't make this, and Nippon Steel actually made these materials. And these were our predictions for the creep life at 650 and 600 degrees centigrade. And these are the experimental results from Nippon Steel. They are not, again, in perfect agreement. And unfortunately, they are just relatively short-term tests are so going to a thousand hours. You really need to go to much longer time periods, but creep testing simply takes a lot of time. Okay. And similarly for the second steel, uh, these are the experimental results from Nippon Steel, and this was our predicted line. We made a mistake in designing these alloys, and the mistake is that we really wanted these steels to operate at 650 degrees centigrade. Uh, but we never actually took oxidation into account. <laughs> yeah. So they will never, they will not be used for 650 degrees centigrade. And then we designed a steel C, which is for oxidation, uh, which ought to be oxidation resistant as well. Okay. So this is very, <coughs> it's useful to talk to people who have a lot more experience in the subject. Now, let's go to the final part, which is about coarsening. Okay. Uh, now, coarsening is driven basically by surface energy. The higher the surface energy, the greater will be the rate of coarsening. And the way that you take account of it is, supposing we plot free energy versus concentration, and this is our, our matrix, the ferrite, and this is the carbide particle, then if we have a sphere, we have a certain amount of surface for unit volume, and we simply raise the free energy curve of the sphere uh, to allow for surface energy. Okay. What that does, it, it modifies the equilibrium concentration. So this is the equilibrium concentration in the matrix for an infinite sized particle, and this is for a small particle of radius r. So 
you get the gradient of concentration from a small particle to a large particle, and that's what drives coarsening. So here, small particle, large particle, and because the equilibrium with a small particle is different from equilibrium with a large particle, we get a flux, and therefore this dissolves and this grows. So coarsening involves the dissolution of some particles and the growth of others at more or less constant volume fraction. And this, again, is well-established theory. Okay. Uh, we don't need to have an explicit coarsening theory because we simply modify the phase diagram to allow for the curvature of the precipitates. So if you just allow your computer to run for a long enough time, initially you get precipitation, and then you go into the coarsening stage automatically. Okay. And this just shows you that the number density of particles decreases during the coarsening stage, and of course it increases during the precipitation stage. Everything seems really good so far, until these data were published uh, from Japan, where they looked at chromium carbide particles, uh, in a series of steels containing different tungsten concentrations. So, according to this, you know, if I increase the tungsten concentration, I get a lower coarsening rate. Okay? You can see that the size of the M236 particles decreases as I increase the tungsten concentration. So, I thought, of course, we can explain this data using coarsening theory. And we, we take account of uh, all the different elements that are there. Whatever we do, uh, this is uh, the coarsening rate depends on the effective diffusivity. Whatever we do, we predict exactly the opposite trend, that as I increase the tungsten concentration, the size of the M23 CSA particles should increase. Okay? So the experiments are fine. There's nothing wrong with the experiments. They show the opposite trend to the calculation. So there's something wrong with coarsening theory, which is not yet solved, but it may be as follows, that really we are using coarsening theory for <coughs> a system in which there's only one kind of precipitate. Okay. But if you have, say, two kinds of precipitates, and the interface energies are different for one kind from the other, then you will also get fluxes between different kinds of precipitates. And that would explain the observation that was reported by Abe that the tungsten accelerated the coarsening rate of the larva space but decreased the coarsening rate of the M23 CS6 particles because larva space has a larger interfacial energy than M23 CS6. So we ought to get a flux this way as well. But this is just an idea. This is a problem that still hasn't been solved. Okay, now, let me finish, because I, I did mention a lot of approximations as I went along, you know, that the microstructures of well metals will be the same as those of steels, uh, because we give this hefty heat treatment, and various other approximations which I haven't even talked about, okay? So I want to explain to you uh, what I mean by the difference between ordinary science and modeling, okay? Because they're both quantitative methods, but there is a significant difference uh, so we start with a very complicated problem, and the way in which ordinary science works, and by ordinary I'm just using the English language meaning of the word, I'm not making a derisory comment at all, <coughs> is that we take this problem and we simplify it until we can have a sufficient, uh, sufficiently rigorous mathematical theory for it, and then we validate the simplified problem. Okay? And that's very good, because it contributes to understanding. But you've lost the original problem completely. Yeah? So, so some people say that, you know, supposing I was modeling a chicken, I would treat it as a sphere and work out its surface area. Okay? Now, in our case, you know, we are not really allowed to do that. Okay? Because we want to solve a particular technological problem. So we take the complex problem, we identify all the relevant issues, we take as much physics as we can, you know, the growth rate, nucleation rate, etc. But we make approximations when the science doesn't exist. Okay. We make approximations so that we can treat the problem as it was originally posed, and we take care to estimate some uncertainties in our methods. 
And finally, we validate the models using data which are not used in creating the models. Okay? So the difference that I see from a modeling between a modeling uh, technique and ordinary science is that we are not allowed to reduce the complexity of the problem. But we are allowed to take many shortcuts and approximations and identify what those approximations are and proceed along here to solve those approximations. Now, the validation part of this is interesting. Um, obviously, when I do a validation, uh, I will focus on the issues that I'm interested in. And these are really complicated models. So I'm never going to uh, be able to properly validate the models because there are too many parts through it. So the best way to validate is to make your models available freely so that people can use them for their own problems. Okay. And then they will go along different paths and identify uh, issues which I would never have come across. So, what we do is we make our computer programs freely available. So the source code, that means the actual Fortran or whatever it is, so that you can modify the programs for your own problem. We even provide compiled programs. And if you don't want to put these programs onto your own computer, you can access them through the World Wide Web and basically put your inputs on, in, and the calculations will happen on our computers and give you the results. Okay? So there is absolutely no excuse for using the work that I've talked about today, and you can access everything from this website. Okay? If you find any problems with the models, that's interesting feedback for us. So that's all I have to say today. Uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 It's very good to take into consideration like something like the uh, dislocation densities. Right. So again, we are going to the properties part. Mm -hmm. And in, I mentioned that in this case, dislocations actually control the, the creep rate. Mm -hmm. okay. But unfortunately, you know, we don't have a method <coughs> for predicting the dislocation density. So I have to use an approximation which I'll talk about tomorrow uh, to deal with that. Experimentally, what you would, would, you would have done it with TM. Like yes. That, I guess. But you know, again, um, that's a measurement I would have to make. And if I'm trying to design an analog system without making a measurement, <coughs> yeah, it's. Yeah, so, so tomorrow's lecture, you must come up with that. I will. I will. Because uh, sometimes I made a nice mini model for, for designing high strength or mean alloys. Mm -hmm. I still have it, I would like to talk to you. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Mm -hmm. right, there is usually some difference in chemical composition of uh, base material and, uh, and well metal. Mm -hmm. And this would be maybe not in chromium continent ambulance. Will be very little, but some other element for different processes you may have higher silicon content or some other element. So, how do your model is uh, coping with such differences? Right. So, so the chemical composition. <coughs> We can take account of variations in silicon, variations in any of the elements. Uh, so if your well metal has a higher silicon concentration, we can take into account uh, that difference in composition. The only point I was making is that from the point of view of the theory, yeah. we don't need to treat them as separate problems. Yeah. Uh, your model also accounts for uh, thermal cycling. Sometimes in the power station they, you know, shut down the whole thing and then the temperature goes to the normal temperature right. for about you know, four weeks, six weeks, and then it starts up again. So is there any effect? No. That's a very good, uh, very good question. Um, and it all goes to, you know, remnant life prediction as well. Now, of course, uh, we haven't applied the model to exactly that problem. <coughs> But in principle, there is no reason why you know you can say okay, 
I've gone to 600 degrees for so long, then I go to another temperature, another temperature, and so on. In principle, it can be done, but we've never actually done the calculation or even validated it. So, just wondering what the, um, you showed the predictions of uncertainty for the modeling outputs. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there a simple way or a, are there a small number of factors that you can attribute that uncertainty to that you could explain to us? Yeah. So, so there are two kinds of uncertainties that we deal with. One is that, you know, when we repeat an experiment, we get a different result. And that's because we haven't controlled some variable. And we normally call that noise. But noise has a meaning. Uh, we don't know what that noise comes from, but that is one kind of uncertainty, that there is scatter in the data because something is not controlled. But there is a second kind of uncertainty which is really interesting, okay? and that is the uncertainty of modeling. And uh, I need a, yeah, I can draw on here, can't I? Sure. Yes, maybe. Yeah. <coughs> so, let me explain. These are all uh, very non-linear models. Yeah? And supposing I'm plotting, uh, I don't know, creep rupture strength or something against chromium concentration. Okay. And I have experimental data here. And I fit a curve to this. Okay. I may be able to fit another function to this. And they might extrapolate completely differently. Because we're not interested in predicting what we already know. We want to predict things that we don't know. Okay? So if there is any ambiguity in the function to represent y, then there will be an uncertainty here, which is a modeling uncertainty. <coughs> uh, you know, I have I may not have any justification for choosing this function or this function. They both might be equally possible, but they will extrapolate differently. So this is a second kind of uncertainty, which I will show you uh, an example of. So th this is what I call modeling uncertainty rather than noise. And you can see it's, it's different here compared with here and so on. So it depends on where you're doing the calculation. If you're doing in a regime where you have a lot of understanding, then it will be a smaller uncertainty <coughs> than when we are doing large extrapolations. And tomorrow I will talk more about this because it's really important with nonlinear models. Okay, so most of that is to do with your microstructure to property um, co-fitting or modeling exactly. as compared with your microstructure prediction. Exactly. It? Right. Yeah. And I mean, there are other uncertainties. So, for example, interface energy might be known to an accuracy of plus or minus 50%. And that would make a huge difference to nucleation rates. So those error bars that we have, in some of those calculations come from the uncertainty in the input values to the calculations. When you solve your coupled equations, what do you take as the size of the object? Uh, okay, so in fact there, uh, let me just, that's a good question. So, um, in the end, the equations turn into volume fractions as opposed to absolute volumes. So, uh, we don't need to explicitly take into account the size of the system. But, but does the solution change if the size of the system changes? No, because uh, in the end, when I integrate this equation, we end up with volume fractions instead of uh, actual volumes. So there's no, there's no surface effects? No. This goes back to before uh, solving a couple of equations to the thermodynamics. Right. If you, uh, can you incorporate, like these calculations are done on the basis of Gibbs free energy, mm -hmm. 
can you incorporate the effect of a stress state into these calculations? Right. Uh, and uh, the following is then, can you then calculate the concentrations using your kinetic approach of each phase at 100 megapascals, for example? Right. Uh, yeah. So, if, if I have a, a precipitate forming, uh, so this is my matrix, and when the precipitate forms, I get a change <coughs> in the volume. Then there will be an interaction with an applied stress on the free energy change accompanying yes. the precipitation process. And if it's just a volume change, it will be a rather small effect. But if I have a displacive transformation, so that there is a sort of a shear, those are really large strains. And then you can have very large effects due to the applied stress, and you can work out a mechanical driving force. So for example, if uh, your resolved shear stress on this plane is torque, and you multiply by this shear strain, that's effectively a mechanical driving force which you can add to your, to your chemical driving force, and therefore modify the whole phase diagram calculation. Okay. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's very easy to actually do that inside the software that's available. Right. is to add this term. Thank you. Thank you. So, so will that allow you to, for example, in the stream cases, calculate, uh, say, uh, the composition of a phase due to strain? Absolutely. Uh, due to stress. Yes. Yes. So stress-induced <coughs> transformation. <coughs> That's right. Any other questions? If not, can we thank Professor Padisha? <laughs>